black thing go from left to right, and I thought, I'm going to die out here. No one's ever going to know. I couldn't believe what my eyeballs were showing me. I'll never forget how evil the eyes were. It was horrible. I mean, I've never seen nothing that evil. It ran towards me at a, at a rate that I, I, I can't even explain. Turned and stared at me. And this look of, I just want to kill you. I want to say it was human, but it wasn't. He was, he, was, he was yelling at me to grab a gun, grab a gun. I was like, for what? He said, just grab a gun. And there's footprints all the way to the door of my house. It had went inside my garage all the way to the door. 911, what are you reporting? Jesus Christ, you better... Sir? See ya. Hello? Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine, I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh-oh. You're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Check us out online at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you've had an encounter, email me. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. It's good to be back with you. I finally got moved. It was a huge pain in the butt, but I won't go into it because no one cares. But uh, just to let you know, it was a huge pain in the butt to move. (laughs) How's everyone doing tonight? Thanks so much for being here. Uh, If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. Got a couple great guests tonight. Going to be speaking to Jamie who had an encounter in Pennsylvania. Very, very odd encounter. Um, And I'll let him tell the story. I'll also be talking to uh, Frank, who comes to us from Tennessee. And he grew up on a property that had these creatures on them. He lived in an area where there was constant sightings. And a lot of his encounters happened back in the 50s and 60s. And I think his last encounter was in the 80s. Uh, But Frank has so much, so many things that have happened to him. We'll try and condense some of that tonight. I'll definitely have to have him back uh, on the show. On Friday night's show, uh, gosh, I went through like the Vegas shooting and Tom Petty dying and uh, the Bigfoot Outlaws broke up. And uh, (laughs) it's like, man, I step away for just a week and everything becomes a mess. I'm sure it has nothing to do with that, but I I like to think it does. Uh, But let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome Jamie to the show. Uh, Jamie, thanks for coming on. Hey, thank you for having me. No, I appreciate you being here. If you would, would you walk into your encounter? Um, I know it happened out there in Pennsylvania. Could you walk us into it? Tell us what you saw, what you heard, and what you experienced. Okay, um, actually, my story kind of starts with my father who lived with me. Um, He had bone cancer, and he lived with me the final year of his life. Um, So he passed away, and my wife and I, maybe like three or four months afterwards, kind of went for a hike just because you know like she kind of said to me Jamie you're like the Pink Floyd guy in the wall video just sitting in your chair kind of devoid of yourself so we went on this hike and I remember we entered this like turkey trail off of 846 in Sharpsville Pennsylvania which is um, Mercer County Pennsylvania and I remember entering the trail and I said you know dad if you're here give me a sign and it was kind of like this thought kind of like a prayer and then I forgot all about it. Um, so we started hiking down this turkey trail, and we made it down to this place called Shenango Reservoir, and there's a creek bed that feeds into the lake. And um, I think at that point, um, my wife was photographing, you know, nature, and our dog was out in front of us, and I noticed that she was right at my feet, and she was whining and shaking, which is not like her because she's a beagle, and... If you know anything about beagles, they're always out in front. So I picked her up, and as soon as I picked her up, we had heard this vocalization in front of us, and it was just this long, wailing-type, crazy vocalization that I've never heard in my life. And, I mean, I grew up in the country, and I know most of the animal sounds, and it was none of those. Um, 
So basically we just stood there and we really didn't say anything and I don't know what the feeling was. It was it was like more like a feeling of like what the hell is going on? And actually I'm still holding my dog and I thought maybe she was stung with a bee or you know stepped on a thorn or something. And we watched these trees in front of us, maybe like 75 to 100 feet away, shaking, and we heard this, like, thud. And then we kept hearing, like, this, I didn't mention this in the email, but we kept hearing this, like, underlying um, hum sound. There was this weird hum. And we looked down, and we watched a puddle on the ground shaking in front of us. So we're standing there, and we're both looking at each other, not really saying any words. And um, I don't know what broke the silence, I think, like, for us, when the when the sound stopped and the movement stopped, we kind of just made this agreement, let's just get the hell out of here. So we, as we turned to leave, and we're, I'm still carrying my dog, you could hear this thing behind us, and you could hear it was like this, oh, oh, and it was kind of like a wind feeling, like some kind of pressure on your back kind of pushing you out. And then um, briefly I turned and I saw like mass, and I saw shape, but I really didn't want to see what was there at that point. And it felt like whatever that was following us was kind of on both sides of us because you could hear it sort of off in the distance and then you would feel it really, really close to you. So then we made it back to our truck and we still did not, we didn't say anything to each other. We kind of just drove. So we get home and um, I think that's when we broke the silence. We got in the house and we were both like, I don't know what that was. Kind of retracing in our mind like what was that you know because we've hiked that area before and we've never had anything happen so then we started researching online animal vocalizations and I don't remember if it was that day or a few days later but for some reason we put in Bigfoot vocalization and um, the record first recording or link that came up was this thing called the Ohio howl and I know like if you're familiar with the Bigfoot world you know that, but at that time, I'm, I'm not familiar with the Bigfoot world, so I didn't know that. I am now aware of it, but it was recorded in a place called Wellsville, Ohio, which is like 40 miles from where this experience happened, and we now know that it was recorded by a guy named Matt Moneymaker, Finding Bigfoot, which I did meet after this thing. Um, I don't know. Um, did it sound like this? <laughs> Is that kind of what you heard? That is absolutely what we heard. And I remember both my wife and I, both as soon as we heard the recording, we both were like, that's, that's what we heard. That is what we heard. Only when you hear the recording on the Internet, it's not as loud and it's not as close as what we heard it. So the legitimacy of hearing that and the validation of hearing that and what we experienced was um, very became very real and it became very serious to us because it was like, you know, in your mind, you th I don't think Bigfoot on the East Coast. I think of Bigfoot out West. I think of where you're at, Washington State or Oregon yeah. or Canada. And I don't really think of the East Coast. But after our experience, then I had to reevaluate and I had to think, you know, like, I think what we experienced was Bigfoot. I can't say 100%, but I'm pretty positive that what we experienced was Bigfoot. So then you dissect and you um, retrace it in your mind over and over again. And, I mean, to this day, this happened 11 years ago, and I still, to this day, retrace it in my mind. But there was um, a retracing that happened when I was on my way to work, and I started thinking about the whole experience. You know, I'd gone back to the location, but it was on this drive to work that I kept thinking, and I heard my dad's voice in my head, and it said, Jamie, if you want to find an answer to something or you lost something, go back to the beginning. So the beginning for me was um, retracing it to the beginning of the trail. And I remember this strange prayer request that I said, you know, Dad, if you're here, give me a sign. And it hit me like crazy on my way to work. The very last memory I had with my dad like a week before he died was, um, I'm sorry, I'm reliving this again. 
No, it's all right. But the take very your time. last memory was he asked me to take him outside so he could um, listen, listen to the birds and look at the trees. And then he looked at me with all seriousness and he said, take me in the goddamn house, you know? And I thought, you know, like, I know when people are sick, they get angry and he's at the end of his life. So I took him in the house and my sister from Maryland gave me this stack of movies. And I said, dad, if you want to watch a movie, I'll just sit here with you. He picked a movie and I put it in the DVD player. And after I put it in the DVD player, I just sat there and I watched my dad and I kept thinking, you know, I love my dad, you know, I, watching him laugh and have fun. And then this memory hit me on the way to work. The very last movie that he watched was Harry and the Hendersons. So then I realized, you know, that's when I realized, you know, there's something more to this Bigfoot thing than just it's physical. Because I believe in, I mean, I'm not a super religious person. I grew up in church, but along the way you just, you know, you have core values and that's who I am. But for this experience, it kind of cha- changed the way I think about everything. And your thoughts mean something. Um, your prayers mean something. Something's listening. So then I thought, you know, like if my dad wanted to get my attention, he really got it in a very big way. Or I don't know. So then I started researching the laws of attraction of the universe and the power of thought. So I'm going online and I'm looking at, you know, the power of thought. I wasn't thinking about Bigfoot that day. But I was thinking about my dad, and I was thinking about a sign. And sort of everything transitioned from that point for me. Like, you know, I started thinking, how, you know, how do hunters hunt for things? And, you know, the hunters out there looking for the big buck. You know, there is some kind of frequency with thought and the vibration and consciousness. So I don't know. And everything's taken on a, on a life of its own now with my research. I understand, and thank you for sharing the story about your dad. It's um, yeah, you're welcome. You know, that's uh, it's touching. It's touching. It, it's. Did you ever go back to that area? I did go back, and I had a second experience there. Um, this was with our friend Roger. Um, it was my wife and I, Roger, and then we had both of our dogs at the time. So we went back and we took him to the location to show him. And I wasn't thinking, I'm going to have an experience. I'm just going to show him where it happened. So we hiked, we hiked there, and then we started coming out. And we heard what sounded like a man talking. Then we heard a whistle, and we heard what sounded like a dog bark. And at that point, my wife was kind of fearful because we have our little dog. So she put both of them on a leash, thinking some dog was going to come out. And nothing came out. So Roger and I went to this ravine, and we looked down, thinking we're going to see a person or a dog come out. And what we saw was this thing stand straight up, and it went straight away from us. But at that point, like, the more of the curiosity seeker type person that I am, I went straight down into it, and it was an area that you really couldn't get to. And it's very, very thick, like, super thick. So we didn't reach it, and it actually moved very fast. Um, And again, I can't say 100% I saw Bigfoot, but again, it's another moment where you're like, it's kind of, think you're thinking about it. So now my wife and I, we study the whole area on a micro level, because I think if you're going to find Bigfoot, you're going to find it like boots on the ground in small areas. You're not going to be, I'm not the person that's going to be going out to Alberta or Colorado. I'm, I'm going to focus on my area, and that's what I, that's what my wife and I do. Yeah, and I respect that. I respect that. Um, wh- what did you see? If if you were to describe to someone what you saw, what, what was that you and your friend looked down in that ravine and saw? Well, to me, what it looked like was a gorilla. Like, it was like a gorilla standing up. So, not necessarily Bigfoot, but it really had, like, mass to it, and it had a large head, and it went straight away from us. It wasn't a deer. It wasn't a bear. Yeah, and that's interesting. And and that's where you heard the vocalization of a man talking and a, and a dog barking com- coming from? Yes. And then, you know, like, um, really after this whole experience, because, you know, like, I'm not a person that said I believe in Bigfoot before this happened because I really didn't, I I could really care less because it's not something I would think about in this area anyway. But now I look at it differently, and uh, my wife and I have researched um, sightings in the area. We've researched and interviewed people, and we actually interviewed a man that was telling us his his experience from Mercer County, Pennsylvania, where we live. And he he was describing it, and I said, oh, my God, that's the exact same location. Like 30 years earlier, he had an experience in the exact same location. So in my mind, this is something that possibly does travel through in this area. I don't know. Be safe, will you, when you're out there? 
be real careful, be real safe when you're out there. And, um, you know, it's, it's strange how sometimes these things happen in, in horrendous times, you know, your dad just passing away and him watching Harry. Did he like Harry and the Hendersons, by the way? He did like that movie because he was laughing, you know, and it's a movie that I'd never seen. And, um, before until that, you know, day I was watching him watch it, but then I had to, I told my wife, I said, you know what? I want to rewatch that movie. And the weird thing is, like, after he passed away, we got rid of everything, and I'm looking for a DVD player because I went out and rented the movie. And here we go. I find the DVD player, pop the video out, and guess what's in there was the Harry and the Henderson. <laughs> it was actually in the DVD player? In the DVD player. Yeah. I knew I had one at our house, but I didn't know that we had still had that exact DVD player with that DVD in it. Yeah. And, like, you know, you'd look for signs or you'd want signs, you get them. They're all around you. It's definitely true. I'm glad to, that you actually had the encounter. What, what does your wife think about it? I know she's not there right now, but what what is her take on it? What does she think it was? Um, well, my wife and I have known each other since we were 10 years old, and we're both like 47 and 48. She, like me, pretty much you know, didn't really have Bigfoot thinking that Bigfoot exists around here, but we both are we're in agreement, and we both experienced it together which I think is pretty cool. And we both don't want to say Bigfoot, but we say Bigfoot because, I mean, that's the closest thing to what we think it would would have been. I get it completely. Well, be careful while you're out there. And I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, come on and share the encounter, Jamie. It's, um, you know, whether it had something to do with your dad or not, it's hard to say, but it, it is a strange coincidence. And, uh, you know, the memory of your dad. And, and again, I'm so sorry to hear about him dying of, of bone bone cancer. It's uh, My dad died of cancer, too, as well. My grandfather died of cancer, and it's a horrendous disease. Um, it's something terrible. No one should have to go through that. No one should have to sit and watch someone go through that. So I'm glad, I, you know, that he's resting in peace now, and, you know, he no longer has to deal with that. And I'm sure he's in a better place. And I, I felt like I'm putting my foot in my mouth. But, I'm, you know, I... I you know, my heart goes out to you. I'm sorry to hear about your dad. And it's a it's a very interesting encounter, especially the second time when you went out there and you heard the vocalization. You know, on the show, sometimes witnesses talk about hearing dog barking or hearing their name being called or hearing uh, these things vocalized in strange ways. And, it, you know, if it wasn't a dog and a man you heard, if it was this creature, it's a very strange vocalization, don't you think, to kind of draw your attention well, I mean, I do think that, like, if it's making a dog sound, that's that's unusual. If it's whistling, I don't think primates whistle. I'm not sure. Um, as far as talking, I'm sure they have a communication. But what really hit me was the actual Wellsville, Ohio recording that hit identical to what that was. And, you know, I, don't, I never really spoke to Matt Moneymaker about, like, where... I, I know where the recording was from Wellsville, but I don't know the circumstances surrounding it like if they debunked it or anything i don't know how the bigfoot world views it no it hasn't been debunked um actually i've heard that i've heard recordings just like the ohio howl it's a little bit different but it's very very similar if i played one you'd go oh that's the ohio howl but i've had recordings out of um texas that sound very similar uh there was one out of uh pennsylvania that i had a guy on the show and he actually had a recording and he and i played it on the show and if you listen to it, you would go, oh, that's the Ohio Howl. But this guy recorded it in Pennsylvania. So it is interesting to get different vocalizations and then to hear the same vocalization being recorded all the way to Pennsylvania, you know, from Ohio to Pennsylvania to Texas. They're getting the same recording. So um, it is it is fascinating. I, I would The only advice I'd give you is just be careful because you, you, you don't know quite what you're going to get into in a situation like that with these things. But um, you have to keep me up to date, and and you and your wife will have to come on if anything new happens out there, will you? I absolutely will, and, and I'm sorry to hear about your father and your grandfather. Thank you for saying that about my dad. Yeah, absolutely, man. And thank you for coming on. All right, no problem. I enjoyed it. Well, next up on the show, I want to welcome uh, Frank. Frank, thanks for coming on. Well, thank you for having me. And what state did your encounters take place in, Frank? I'm in uh, Tennessee, in Tennessee uh, middle Tennessee. Well, if you would, I know there was a lot going on 
um, around some of these properties you grew up in. Uh, but if you would, would you talk about your first encounter, the first time you saw this creature, and just for the audience, kind of walk us into what you were doing and just walk us into what happened. Okay. Uh, the, fir- the first encounter, uh, I mean, I did not know it was an encounter. Uh, I knew nothing about what a Sasquatch or Bigfoot was or even that they existed or anything like them existed. Um, we had moved back from Detroit. This was in 1964. Had moved down way out into the country. There was no barn on the property about 150 foot up the hill from the house. And uh, there were several of us kids Anyway, we were up in the barn loft up there, and uh, there was hay stacked on both sides. The middle was open, and you um, go up a ladder uh, in the middle of the barn. You know, it's just a two before it's tacked up, and uh, it's about a three foot hole, three foot by three foot hole there in the barn. On uh, the far side next to the house, the hay was kind of stair stepped, and on the other side, it was just straight up. I mean, it was several bells high uh, where we could not get on top of it. So we played there on the other side where the stair step bells were. You know, we just jumped around playing tag with each other. It was like uh, five of us all total. And we're from age uh, from uh, six to uh, 12. I was, um, I was born crippled. In the right foot, I had a club foot. I just recovered from the operation and never could keep my shoe tied on my right foot. It always came unloose. So anyway, we uh, were uh, playing, jumping around in the hay. Got tired. Everybody decided to go home. Somebody hollered out the last one to the house is, I'm not going to mention it over the phone, but it wasn't a rotten egg. It was something else. <laughs> you yeah. know, we, 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 we grew up in it. We were little Hagans, I guess you'd call us. So anyway, uh, everybody went down the hole and uh, started running toward the house and screaming. I knew I couldn't run because my shoe was untied. So I stopped at the bottom of the ladder and put my foot up there and was tying my shoe. And everybody was gone and they were still running down the hill and I heard something up in the loft where we just came out of uh jump down it pretty hard and run across to a little opening um where they used to bring the hay in, you know, they back back up and, and bring the hay through that door. Yeah. And um I knew Everybody had come down, and I was the last one left. I thought, who is that? Now, we were way, way out in the country. Um, so um, I, I tied my, tied my shoe, uh, stuck my head back up through the hole, and I seen what I thought was somebody. They were all one color. Um, kind of a chocolate brown color. Not a, any long hair per se. I mean, I, I didn't really get a good look. Of course, you know, scared the crap out of me. There was somebody up there. Where were they at while we were playing in the hay? I don't know. I cannot figure it out where they were. I just saw the back of it. I did not see any front of it. And when I left got down and left the barn. I had to run right out under where it was over the top. I didn't look back, and that was my first encounter. Of course, at that time, I thought I was looking at a human. But thinking back on it, that was not no human. It was not a big creature. It, It was smaller than my dad, but it was bigger than we were. Yeah, interesting. What What was it about it that made you think... That's not a human. Was it just mainly the hair? Oh, I, I didn't. I didn't know it wasn't a human until later on in life. I mean, it oh, just, I gotcha. it was just one color. I mean, and it was in the middle of the summertime. 
uh, why would somebody have a uh, one color jumpsuit on from head to toe? And it was a um, it wasn't a uh, black, but it was close to black. It was, it was a brown looking color because in the doorway there there was a lot of light, so I got a good look at the back of it, and um, it just looked like a human figure standing there. Did you ever tell anyone about this? Did you get back to the house and tell your dad or anyone? Well, I told some of the other kids, and they laughed at me. You, you know, call me chicken crap, you know? You little chicken shit. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, no, I understand. At that's what, what I got out of them. At what point later in life did you realize, oh, that's what that thing was? Oh, uh, can't pinpoint a time. It was after I found out that these things existed. And it's on up to after the second encounter that I knew that they called them Bigfoots or Sasquatch. How many how many um, years later was your next encounter? That second encounter where you had the visual? It was about two years later. We had moved from that spot um, about 10 miles across a couple of ridges uh, closer to town uh, by the city reservoir. Uh, let me tell you, there's a bunch of stuff happened there. Uh, it's still a rural area. We lived down, it was a, a dead end road off of a paved road. You got on a gravel road and you went to the end of that. And then you turn right and you went about another three quarters of a mile to our house. And there was only two houses during all that travel all the way to the back. And, uh, it had been an old pretty good sized farm back in the day, but um, it was one of those weatherboarded houses with two story with no paint on it. And then there was another little house down at the bottom, I guess that had been for the farm, farm hands, whoever just, but um, it was about uh, 150 to 200 feet away from the other house. We grew up poor. I mean, we were dirt poor. We never had a vehicle or anything. And the only way back and forth to the store, uh, the store was about, all two and a half miles away, three miles away, something like that. My mom would always, if we needed something, she'd send a couple of us to the store, so we'd walk store and back. When we came out of our driveway or road, straight across was the uh, little lake, uh, was the city reservoir, what that was. You turn left and go on down, you hit the main highway. And then you go about a half a mile, and there's a little store that we, we'd we go to. And um, so me and my brother, he's two years older than me. Uh, one day it was our turn to go to the store. It was midday, middle of summer, um, hot. So um, on the way back from the store, about a quarter mile from the reservoir, about 40 foot in front of us, we saw two big legs with feet on them. So we saw them about six inches above the knee down. They were a um, rust color, red color, orangutan color hair on them. But you could, um, around the knee was kind of, you could see the skin and stuff through the hair. And um, it's probably two inch hair all the way down the legs, but it, the feet is is mainly what I, I was looking at. I, I can remember my f- first thought. I mean, you know, we were poor. We ran around in the summertime without shoes on. But when we walked store on that gravel road, we'd put our shoes on. Those gravels hurt. I don't care how tough your feet are. You've got a ways to walk, you put your shoes on. Yeah, of course. Well, the first thought out of my mind is this poor SOB ain't got no shoes on. I mean, I remember that. That was my first thought when I saw it. I mean, actually, it was my second thought. First thought was, what is that? Me and my brother both saw it at the same time. Now, he was standing at the side of the road, and it was kind of, he thought he was tucked back in that foliage is what he thought where we couldn't see him, but the foliage only went so far, and then it was clear on the bottom. And so that's what we got the best view of was the legs and the feet. Like I say, it was 35, 40 foot away. 
And uh, so we just stopped in our tracks and was looking at it. Being two dumb little kids, we started to word it. We wanted to see the rest of it. I do remember as we started to word it, looked up and there was in the shadows of the foliage was a the left side of its face looking at us. I, I did see an eye and a mouth and a jawline. Um, so anyway, we started walking toward it, and we were walking to our right on out into the road so we could get a better look at it, line up with it. And about that time, it jumped off the side of the road. Uh, it jumped out. Now, the side, side of the road was six foot higher than the little field that was beside the road. And, uh, of course, the field was growed up with all blackberries and uh, um, bushes about 12 foot high and it's real thick. Couldn't, couldn't hardly get through it, or we couldn't get through it. We'd been in that field a week before that picking blackberries, and we couldn't get back in there. So anyway, it jumped out about eight foot out. It's, like I say, it's six foot down because there was a fence right there, and they had to clear that fence. Uh, at the bottom of the road. So that was a pretty good leap. And when it hit, we seen the fur bounce on the back of it. And when it hit, it was running. I mean, that thing just took off through that uh, uh, blackberry briars and the bushes. You could hear it just busting through there. Got to the river. Now, there was about, oh, I guess 150 foot to the to the little creek down there, which is about twenty foot wide, because you know we'd been down there waiting in it uh, before. We heard two splashes, and that's it. I mean, we never heard nothing else. We went home, told them we saw a wild man. That's all we knew at the time to call it. We saw a wild man. That was pretty much it. I mean, we we got a little bit of ridicule from other people. We'd tell. And we didn't know what it was until my older brother had um, visited us from um, Washington there. He lived up there in Yakima. And uh, he had come in, and and we told him what we saw. So he filled us in on what a Bigfoot and a Sasquatch was. Going back and, and thinking about the face that you saw, would you say it looked more monkey-like? Would you say it looked more human-like? Or did it look nothing like either or? I'd say it was more human-like. I mean, it was a uh, Neanderthal-looking. It had a uh, um, pronounced uh, brow ridge. Um, no hair on the face. So that I mean, I could make out that. Like I say, we didn't get a good look at the face. I was mainly concentrating on the feet and the legs. I mean, these was big stove. You know what a stove pipe, seven-inch stove pipe is? Oh, yeah. That's how big those legs were. Yeah. No, I've the said lower that. legs. It's funny you say that because in my own encounter, I describe them like tree trunks. They were huge. I mean, absolutely huge. Uh, way out of proportion for a person, wouldn't you say, Frank? Yes. Absolutely. And it's, uh, you know, one thing that's interesting is you moved, but you really didn't move that far away. I mean, in the grand scheme of life, 10 miles really isn't that far away. Um, especially all right. I, I thought about Go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Frank. I mean, cut you off. I've thought about that. And if, if you took a, uh, you know, a, a pin point and stretched 10 miles out with a rope and made a circle, that's there we moved in. I mean, that's the neighborhood we live in. Like I say, it's right dead smack in the middle of Tennessee. Yeah, and I've had a lot of inc- I've had a, actually a lot of encounters from Tennessee, and I, I guess I don't think of Tennessee that way. Um, maybe Southern Tennessee, but um, I've had a lot of reports from Tennessee, which kind of I don't know why it shocks me. It does shock me that you, you would think I don't know. I'm about to make a dumb comment, but I do get a ton of reports out of Tennessee. Actually, a ton of reports. Was there ever a time? I mean, you guys are running all over the countryside. I'd be a little, I guess times were different back then. If my kids came home and said they saw a wild man, uh, I would be a little more concerned. But I guess back then, Frank, you know, it's, that's what made men men is go out there, hope for the best. And, you know, well, 
that wasn't the first time that happened in our family. Back in 59, my brother, almost the same scenario. We lived on top of the mountain at that time. I would have been probably four years old, but I do remember him coming home scared. Uh, he had walked to the store, which was three miles away again, uh, to that store. Like I say, we, we were poor. We never heard of error on the vehicle. Um, unless somebody came and took us or, you know, we walked out and they brought us back. You know, we did not have a car. And, um, uh, this was my older brother, probably nine or 10 years older than me. Uh, we lived up on the mountain and, uh, we lived at, right at the top of the mountain. He had been to the store and he come home and told that a hairy man came out of the woods, stopped in front of him as he was crossing the road. It stopped in front of him. I looked him up and down and grunted at him, walked on into the woods. This would have been about a mile from where we were living uh, on his way back from the store. And that was in the afternoon when it, that happened also. He told that story to the day he died. I mean, uh, of course, you don't tell a whole lot of people about this because you get ridiculed. I wanted to ask you about that. That's 1959, and obviously the the Patterson-Gimlin film hadn't come out for roughly another eight, nine, ten years. Um, it's set to come out. And w what did he describe? What did he—I realize he said wild man, but what did he—was um, there anything— he just, Yeah, he just says the big hairy wild man. That's the way he described it. Yeah. Big hairy wild man. He just uh, grunted at him, he said. And well, yeah, I'll tell you one thing. about his business. I'll tell you one thing about his encounter that's fascinating is as I think <sighs> when they grunt at you, I think they're acknowledging you. Um, I don't think it's meant to be aggressive, and that's my own personal opinion, my own personal theory. I think when they grunt at you, it's just their way of acknowledging. I've, I've talked to hunters that have shot them after they grunt towards the hunter, um, and I really think it's more or less of them – it's not really meant to be aggressive. I could see how someone would take it as um, aggressive, but that's interesting about your brother and, and his, that small detail from his encounter. Cause you hear other people talk about these things stepping out and then, you know, it grunts at them and then just kind of keeps going its own way. Anyway, just kind of a side note, I wanted to ask you too out there all after all these years of, of running into these things and probably hearing them, and we haven't really talked about any of that yet. Um, was there ever a time where you felt like your life was in danger or like you just... Yes, uh, a few years later, this incident happened that uh, I knew I was fixing to die. Uh, but that's jumping ahead too far. There's more that happened here at this one place where we lived there by the reservoir. Now, you have to... Country folk live different from city folk. I guarantee it. Country folks' bathrooms are 200 foot from the back of the house. City folks are in the, in the side. So, you, you know, one night, and this is in the same place where we, the same summer that we saw that thing, my older brother, he was four years older, uh, one night was trying, came in and was trying to wake my other brother up, which is two years older than me the one that was with me when we saw it and, uh, telling him, Hey, come out here and listen to this. Come on. You know, and it was somewhere around one to three o'clock in the morning late, but I woke up instead. And, um, he told me to go back to sleep. And I said, no, I got to use the bathroom. I got to get up. So me and him went back out on the front porch. Of course, as country folk do, I stepped to the end of the porch. We had a long front porch. And I was peeing off the end of the porch. And I said, what is it? And he said, just listen. And then I could hear it after I kind of woke on up. There was a behind uh, the barn set over across the driveway from, from the house. And um, 
uh, behind the barn, there was nothing but wilderness woods, a uh, big stone boulder that had been pushed up out of the ground, and a uh, real rugged terrain up in there. We heard a baby crying. I mean, if the more I listened, the louder it got. And so we stood there for, I know, 10, 15 minutes listening to that baby cry. My dumb brother, he, he was hollering, man, he said, that's a baby. He said, I'm going to go up there and see that that's a baby. Well, I know what I had seen earlier. I wasn't about to go up there with him. I said, you can go if you want to. I went back in the house and went to bed. Um, he, of course, he never did go up there. About a month later, he was always getting up in the middle of that, too. Um, about a month later, he said he was out on the front porch. And he saw a man, tall man, walking up the road. At the end of our driveway was our well. Beyond that was an old tractor road that went on up around the wood line into the fields along the hay fields and the pasture fields. And, um, but there was a gate there. Um, you seen those flat gates, four foot high, 10 foot long. Yeah. And uh, it was taller than I was, and I was nine years old at the time. But uh, he said that um, he saw a man walk up our driveway or walk up the road and uh, go between the house and the barn and the well out there. And he said he was he was carrying something. It was dark. He really couldn't see nothing but the outline of it. He said it stepped over that gate and kept walking on down that tractor road off up into the wilderness, uh, the woods. Of course, you know, I didn't really doubt him, but I didn't think too much of the story anyway. I, I mean, I, the, the gate was taller than me. I, I, I thought, no, I can't nobody step over that gate. But now I know they can. Did he ever know what it was carrying? Did he ever give you? No, no, he never did say. He just said it was carrying something. What did he think of the whole thing? What it was his opinion? I mean, four foot tall gate. You hear of them walking over five foot tall gates, just stepping right over and keep going. Um, what did your bro- did your brother think it was a man? Or at that point, had he? Yeah, guessed? yeah, he thought it was a man. Now this is before we knew what the the Sasquatch was. I mean, um, it wasn't long after that that we did know what it one was. But um, he just he just said it was a tall man. That's what he way he described it. But it was in the middle of the, you know, middle of the night. He was kind of the man of the house, I guess you'd call him. I mean, he 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 had a protective instinct because that my dad was always gone. He was never at home. Um, we grew up without a dad, pretty much. So so it was just our mom and five, sometimes six kids. Whenever the older one wanted to come around and freeload. So at what point did you, was it when your brother told you what these things were? Is that when you guys kind of figured out, oh, that's what this thing is? Or was there a different time where you'd come to the conclusion, oh, that's what this thing is? Well, now, uh, he had come in and we told him what we had been seeing. So he set us all down. I mean, he was young. He was He was probably... 20, 21 years old. He had been around and, and he'd had his own experiences um, running around, you know, as a teenager there. And then, of course, there was, he, he told us about an incident with him out in Arkansas when he, he was hitchhiking through Arkansas one time. Something came out of the swamp on him. But anyway, he had learned about what a, a Bigfoot and Sasquatch was and he set us all down and explained to us what they were. As as time went on, we we uh, we told a few people about our encounter, and we just got kind of laughed at and ridiculed. So, am I am I jumping too far ahead with the moment where you were in terror when you ran into this thing? Well, a little, little bit. There's another story. <laughs> okay. Um, now, where we lived there by the reservoir, something one night, um, my mom smoked and. And they were, uh, was a couple lived in that other house and they smoked too. 
and um, she uh, tried to get us to go down and borrow her some tobacco or cigarettes. Of course, it was 9.30 at night, didn't want to go. But my little brother, younger brother, he's two years younger than me, was, was all about two years apart. He took the flashlight. We did have a flashlight at that time. Small one, not too bright. Um, he took the flashlight and went down there. And about 15 minutes later, he come back. He was, his knees was muddy and he was breathing hard and stumped the high heaven. And uh, he said something grabbed him there by the pear trees. There was some pear trees in between our house and the other house down there. Um, There's a whole line of them. There's about six pear trees. And um, something had grabbed him. He, uh, we asked him what it was. And he said, I don't know. He had black, hairy arms and uh, threw him down in the mud. And uh, he'll still tell you the same story today, you know. I wasn't there, so I, you know, I didn't see no uh, nothing that happened. Not long after that incident right there, um, our house burnt down. I mean, it burnt to the ground. So my mom, um, we, we was kind of strode around with family members for a couple of weeks there, and she had uh, went out and rented another house about eight, nine miles on up, you know, the ridge there. On, uh, we call it a mountain. It's it's a big hill, but we call it a mountain. And um, it was on this uh, called Sheep Bluff Road, and it was the only house on there, and it sat right in the middle of it. We didn't have much, and of course, when the house burnt, we had a whole lot less. Um, bring everything we had. All, all we got out with was what we was wearing. And that we didn't even get out of the house with shoes on. Anyway, we moved in this little old four-room house up there. It had been a long time since anybody had lived there. She scrounged up some beds and a uh, wood cook stove. It was just a small area um, where the house sat up on a little knoll. Uh, and then the gravel road was on the gravel road again. We'd have to, our, our, us boys would go up into the woods and, and uh, get limb, dead limbs that had fell and, and small dead trees and drag them back and chop them up for the wood cook stove because that was the only heat we had also, but that was somewhere around in March is when all this took place. We had a, um, I don't know, we'd always find us a grapevine with us and go in the woods and cut it to swing on. We'd have to go a little further each time we went into the woods to get the stuff that we could carry and drag back because um, we were small. But we'd have to go a little further each time. I guess we'd been doing that for about a month uh, at the new place. One morning I got up and I couldn't find nobody in the house. wonder where everybody was at. So I went outside and there laid the garden. Everybody was outside at the wood pile. Uh, don't know what happened. It's kind of funny. Uh, people don't believe this at all when I tell them. Uh, there was a pile of, of dead branches and green branches uh, laying there, and we don't know how they got there. And there was such a big pile, we never did. We only lived there like three months um, before we moved out of there because it's pretty snaky way back up in there. Um, we never did have to go back in the woods to drag more branches out of them woods. That pile accumulated overnight. I believe you. I think um, I think it's interesting. I, I really do. I mean, that's, that's about one of the strangest things that ever happened. Yeah, not, not as strange as you would think, but... Um, I can see where you're coming from, seeing that wood pile there. But it, I'd like to say that shocks me, but it doesn't shock me one bit. Um, what, what did you? What was the conversation like? Was it just confusion? Yeah, I was confused. Uh, we just uh, didn't think much more about it. Now, like I say, what we had done was we moved on in that house and. There was a copperhead being under that house. 
because we were killing two or three copperheads a day, and we found out that, yeah, they were coming from under the house. And uh, that that's no, no joke. We was killing two or three a day, and we didn't find them inside the house. But we got out that our house had burnt to the rest of the family and all that stuff. So uh, my sister uh, came in from Detroit, and then my brother, the older brother, had uh, come in, and they got together and moved us off the top of that mountain uh, down into town. And um, I was, but during all this process, I'd done turned 10 years old. All right. That was the end of that. There was no more, I mean, there was some more stuff happened, but I didn't go into it. Um, skipped down the road to 1970. Still hadn't seen that parish and Gimlin film. I didn't see that to shoot 78, 79. Didn't pay no attention to it. My brother, um, when he moved us to um, town, I think that was in 66, he had left and went to Washington State, um, up there in Yakima, Washington, and uh, had got married to this girl. And uh, they lived up there in uh, Moxie, I think it is, right outside of Yakima. Anyway, he they moved in back down here. He moved her down here with me, you know, kept telling her about how pretty tense she was. They had moved in. We were living in Sparta at that time. They had moved in a house, I guess, as a mile and a half from where we lived on top of that snake den. If you went through the the woods, you'd be about a mile and a half there. Like I say, that was that's a real rural area up in there. There was not a lot of houses. He lived there for the summer, and uh, I guess she got tired of it and wanted to move back to Washington. So he came down and. Asked me if I'd go up there and help him load the U-Haul. Of course, you know, I was 14 years old. Sure, he's my older brother. Like him a lot. I go help him load the U-Haul. Now, where they live back in there, there's only one way in and one way out. And that gravel road was five miles long. Back off up in there, somebody had made a pretty nice little farm back up in the middle of the woods up there. Now, between the house and the barn, there was a old tractor road uh, that went down into the valley down there. There was another deal about that, but I won't go into that. Um, but I knew it went down into and came out into some pastures in the valley. So anyway, I went up there to help him blow to you home. It was late on a Sunday evening. I think it was about September. All the leaves are still on the trees. When I got up there, he wasn't helping load the U-Haul. He was making me load it. So we got into a little fisticuff there, an argument. And he told me, no, you you know, he was going to make me load that U-Haul. Well, I, being a 14-year-old, tough man, strong man, going to whoop your butt if you mess with me, I knew it all. I grab a box, go out there, set it on the tailgate, and take off out of there. I mean, he was a lot bigger than I was. I, I weighed every bit of 80 pounds at that time. So I, I knew if I stayed on that road, that thing was, you know, five miles long, he just going to come along and drag me back. I got all down there almost to the barn, and I, I remember them talking about that road coming out into some pastures through the woods about two miles long. So I took off down that road through the woods to get away, you know. I hadn't been in the woods 15 minutes, and it started getting dark. I mean, dark. That was more than two miles down through there. Um, I grant you that. It got to where you could just barely see. I got, I guess, in the middle, what I call in the middle of the woods, about midway. It got pretty dark. I mean, that's when I heard something started walking beside of me. It was 250, 300 foot away from me, but it was kind of, it's a downhill grade, but it was flat across through there. 
one way, but like a, I don't know, five degree grade downhill. And I could hear it. And I thought, that's that SOB coming after me. And about the time I got that, I thought out of my head, I thought, no, he too chicken to come down through there. That's not him. So I thought maybe a deer. But I'm listening to it that far away walking. So I kind of picked my pace up a little bit. Now, granted, this is a real snaky area. Rattlesnake, our heads go lower up in there. Now I'm, I've got that in mind. All at the same time, I'm listening to whatever is walking over the, from me here. I get almost out of those woods, and I mean, it gets so black you can't see the hand in front of your face. I could manage to see a little bit of gray through the foliage of the trees. I aim for the gray spot. And to stay on that little old tractor road I was on, if I got too far to the left, I'd rush up against the foliage, the trees, you know, sticking out. If I got too far to the right, I'd, br- I'd brush up that. So if I, either way, I'd, I'd move back over and find my way out of there. It probably took me 10, 12, 15 minutes to, to finish finding my way out of there before it wasn't so dark. When it came out, it was a little bit of gray sky left, a very little. Um, to my right, I saw a, a, a roof of a barn. It's probably a mile away through the pasture. And um, saw a little bitty porch light on, little dim light. So that's what I headed for. Still staying on this little tractor road. Even though I was in the pasture, I could still hear it up in the tree line. It still is about 300 foot away from me. I came up to the first gate. And of course, there's one of them flat gates that's four foot high. And it had the wood locust post with the barbed wire on the sides. I crossed the gate or clam across it. I didn't open and shut it. I just, you know, I was pretty young and agile. I just hopped over it. I got about six, eight steps away from that gate. I heard that barbed wire fence creak all the way down the line. And boy, I knew then I was in trouble because whatever was following me could push a fence down across it. That's when fear really did sit in. I was scared. Still hadn't laid eyes on whatever it was. I crossed four or five fences like that coming out of those pastures because they had them sectioned off. And that barbed wire just kept going up into the woods. Every time I would cross it, I mean, it was the same scenario. Get five, six, eight steps away from the gate, that barbed wire fence would creak. When you say that, do you mean like it was climbing over the gate and following you? No, it wasn't climbing over the gate. It was climbing. It was pushing the fence down on up in the woods. And I don't, are you familiar with how they used to do the old fencing? With the locust post and staple. No, I'm not. Uh, holding a piece of barbed wire fence up. And if you push down on it anywhere along that line, it, you know, it stretches it. And it is oh, pulled through you. those staples. I got And you. it is freak. It is freak. Anyway, that's what it was doing. So I knew it was crossing every fence I crossed. So it's getting on toward dark. By the time I got to that barn, it was pitch black. And it was coming on the right side of the barn because the wood line was coming closer to that house and that barn. And I knew as soon as I stepped around that barn, I was, it was going to nab me because it got there before I did. I could hear it walking in the woods. So I got to the, I thought, well, let me get up to that house. I'm going to knock on that door and get somebody to help me because I don't know what this is. I mean, I did know what it was. I, I felt it was a thing that we had seen uh, five years earlier. wasn't sure I hadn't laid eyes on it, but I could hear it. Got to the house, no cars in the driveway. It was a nice brick home. Not the first car was in that driveway. So I didn't know, you know, I, I was kind of dumbfounded. I was scared. I thought, I can't break in there and do I'll get in trouble. I can't break in the house. 
I can't go in the barn and they'd come and get me. I, the only thing I had to do was for to keep walking. So, I mean, I had paused for about 30 seconds there in front of that house trying to figure out what to do. As soon as I got to where the trees started, I mean, they came right down to the road. I walked by and uh, probably got about 10 foot into the tree where the tree started. And um, it started falling right in behind me. Now, it was 15 to 20 foot from me. I promise you, if you put an elephant on his back feet, that's what was in them woods. That's how heavy those footsteps were. You could hear every crunch, every twig that broke, and you could almost feel them. Now, I'm 14. I'm walking as fast as I can walk, and I'm telling you I was moving. It was taking one step to my two or three, and it was keeping up with me in some of the worst terrain you ever laid your eyes on. Big, that had been a volcanic area. And rocks had been pushed up out of the ground, and that little ridge line right through there was one of them. And um, so there was big boulders in there, too. I mean, the, not gigantic, you know, two to foot by two foot by six foot by eight foot boulders pushed up everywhere. And uh, all different sizes. That thing followed me right now. I, might, I better throw this in. I would stop to listen to this thing walking. As soon as I stopped, it would stop. It would maybe take one step and then stop. Now, Wes, it was black as black could be outside. I could not not see my hand in front of my face. There was no moon. I don't remember seeing stars. It may have been overcast, a light overcast, but it was black outside. The only way I could see to stay on that road, the road was gravel, limestone gravel. So you could make out, you know, it's great. I knew at any moment I was fixing to get to an eight. <laughs> Whatever this was, which... By this time, I done figured out something that heavy. That's what I saw when I was nine. And that's when the fear really, really set in. It's when it got so close to me. I felt like I wanted to throw my insides up. I wanted to pee on myself. I mean, I I wanted to pee so bad it it hurt. But I was not about to stop and pee. (laughs) I, I got... I just I thought, well, if it's gonna get me, it's gonna get me. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go. I'm not gonna stop and challenge it. So anyway, this thing followed me, fifteen to twenty foot from me, for about a mile and a half. And that's the tree tree stopped, and that hillside stopped, and then there was kind of a, um, a grassy area. Area. I was almost out to the paved road. So it it stopped following me right there. I quit hearing it. Or it didn't stop following me. I just quit hearing it. It's what I've done. Now, I was beyond scared, son. I I mean, I was beyond the word scared. I knew that's the way I was fixing to die. I thought nobody's ever going to know what happened to me. You know, this thing's going to get me. So when it stopped following me, I kind of, now, during all this, you would uh, think I would take off running. No, I knew not to run. I got out to the paved road, which is another mile through that grassy area, maybe three quarters of a mile from the, where the wood line stopped and the pavement started. I cut left, headed toward town. Now, this is a, uh, a major highway. It's two lane. Like I say, this was on a Sunday night. There was only three cars past me that whole time. I was on that paved road, and they were going the opposite way. I I was going every time one passed, I'd look around because I got about 200 foot down that paved road. This sucker had came out of there, the same road I did, and crossed over into the woods and was following me again. I thought I had got rid of it. 
but no, it kept following me. Now, it would not get close to that paved road. It stayed about 7,500 feet up into the woods. About 30 minutes, they had followed me down that paved road. I heard this tree where it, where it was walking. There was this tree come over. I heard the crack, and, and I heard the tree coming through the other trees. And it hit. It had to be a pretty good-sized tree because it hit with a bang. I mean, it was loud. Now, that was a little ways from me, um, probably 150 foot at this time. I kept walking, and uh, there was this old abandoned gas station there. It was painted a real baby blue, sky blue, and you could make out the outline of that old gas station, and they had two bay doors, two bays on it with double doors that swung out like barn doors. They had a kind of a log chain holes in the door and a log chain and with a, a lock on them. And, uh, but there's no, there was nobody using the station at that time. It's still not that the thing's still there and it's not in use. I got right past that a station. It set off about 60 foot from the road, maybe 80 foot somewhere in there. It sounded like, I mean, that thing was still stomping through the woods as I was coming up to the station, and then I quit hearing it. It sounded like it grabbed a hold of those chains and started beating against that door, just back and forth, back and forth. And, I mean, it was loud and it was hard. Now, there was a street light up the road. as only light out there, and it was about a quarter mile away. And then when it, oh, that's what it sounded like it took down. And I don't know what it was doing, to be honest with you. I didn't see it. Uh, but it sounded like it was taking those chains and beating them back and forth against that door. That's when I took off into a run. I mean, I was so scared. It was pathetic. I'm old enough now. I don't care who knows it. I was scared to death. I thought to myself, this is what I thought I didn't. I thought, if it's going to get me, I want to see what it is. That's why I took off for that street line. Well, I, when I took off running, I didn't stop till I got to that little old store. It had a little light out front. I stopped at it, which was a mile and a half away from where I started running. And um, this is still about 9.30 at night, 10 o'clock, somewhere in there. I stopped there at that little old store and, and took a rest. Kept looking for it to come, you know, down because there's a couple other houses with their porch lights on around. And I never never did see anything. Now, that little old store is the same store where we had been to when I was nine years old when we walked back over to the other house. That's That was the scenario there. I mean, we all, all we done was move you know, 10 miles up the, the ridge there. Like I say, it all was in one area. It's terrifying, isn't it? To, especially when you're being followed like that. It feels very aggressive. And isn't it, and you probably know this better than I do, Frank, but because you grew up around these things, but there's a lot of times where they seem like they're friendly. I mean, like waking up the next morning and there's a pile of firewood outside your door. And then there's other times where you run into these things and they don't, it doesn't feel friendly at all. It feels very aggressive. It feels very, I'm sure your brother's encounter of being grabbed in the woods was starting to come back to you in that moment, that whole time you were trying to move away. And get Every, away. Everything. I mean, everything did. Yeah. I hate to interrupt you, but no, no, you're fine. I sit around sometimes and I'm, I'm old now. I can hardly get out into the woods, but I sit around sometimes and think what that thing done to me that night. It makes me so mad. I want to grab my assault rifle and go up there and just sit and wait on it and kill it when I first see it. And then there's other times I that thing didn't bother me. I think I was just escorted out of that area. It wanted to scare me. It was trying to scare me. What I was dealing with and what I have found out I'm dealing with is one of the most intelligent 
things besides the human on the face of this earth. I would tend to agree with you. I think there's a lot of things with these things. They are a lot smarter than we think. And um, it makes me wonder if it was the same creature you, you had seen and you'd run into before in the past or if it was different. Obviously, if it oh, wanted man. you, it would have it would have grabbed you. I mean, you would have you were easy pickings at that point. And it didn't. And that's the part that always confuses me about these things, because it does feel very aggressive. You know, I've I've had people on the show in the past who've had encounters like this and um, they feel very threatened by it. They feel like they're being escorted, but it's a little more than being escorted. It's if you stop, yeah, I'm going to kill you uh, type feeling that people get. And I don't know if that's the intention that these things are trying to do. I guess banging the chains would be, you know, aggressive. Um, I'm just glad you made it out of there. I'm glad it left you I alone. Think it was, I think it was trying to scare me. I think it was intelligent enough. It knew it was scaring me, and it was trying to tell me, don't come back here. We don't, you know, stay out of here. Now, what, what? I have been back to that area. I grant you. I do not go back without being armed or staying in my buddy in the car. Yeah. Um, I can go up there. Uh, sometimes I'll, I'll get out of the vehicle and and go back up there on some of the old roads that where nobody's around. And I'll uh, do some knocks on. I got two sticks that I use, two oak sticks, and I can hit those. I'll get an answer back, or I'll whoop, and I'll get a bird call back. Uh, about a month ago, I was up there, and I've got a convertible, and uh, I was sitting there in the convertible and just stopped and waited for about 10 minutes and then let out a big whoop. And about 200 foot away from me, now that I, I stopped in an area where there's massive boulders. I'm talking house-sized boulders that fell off of the ridge. I got a weird weird bird call back let me ask you a quick question what what do you think that these creatures are if someone were to ask you frank what is sasquatch what what are these things what would you say to them oh in the genome uh i think they're the missing link that everybody's looking for they're not an ape and they're not a human they're their own species I mean, there's not no mix there. They are their own species. They're too intelligent. Too intelligent. There was no crossing, I don't think, of genes. They they, they formed on their own. Uh, the research I've done, they've been here for thousands of years and been seen for thousands of years. I, I've talked to Sibylla about this. As a matter of fact, I've talked to her a couple of times. She's a great person. Um, I think you probably know her. Um, she's up here in Kentucky. Yeah, Sibylla does the, for the audience listening, she does the artist renditions of uh, what witnesses say they saw. And, and she does a great job. Actually, I've talked to Sibylla before. She's very sweet, very nice lady. But go ahead, Frank. Just give yeah, the audience a background. Person. Yeah. Um, it was when, when I talked to her. It's the first time I ever got to talk to anyone about this with that has some intelligence talking back most people will ridicule you or say oh yeah oh yeah i believe you won't believe it i can't make nobody believe it until they experience what i've experienced and so i I don't tell too many people about my experiences i just want to grab them and by the throat and drag their butts up there and drop them off in the middle of the night and say, here, have your own. It, it pisses me off, to be frank with you. That, what you know, does? They're ridicule oh, I get about yeah. what I'm tell, trying to tell them and what I'm trying to tell them what's out there. They sit in their recliners and their couches and uh, run around and camp out every now and then, but no, they have no idea what's out there. It's just, it, that's what pisses me off. Yeah, well, more and more people are starting to come forward. You know, more and more people are are coming forward. And there is a ridicule factor. I don't know that that will ever go away until one of these things is dragged out of the woods and uh, for everyone to see. 
I think there'll always be somewhat of that ridicule. The frustrating part about the the Bigfoot subject is uh, there's a lot of evidence. There's a there's a ton of evidence. I think if we were dealing with um, let's say a feline out there, um, a prehistoric free feline, um, you know, like a saber toothed tiger, and everyone had the same descriptions, and we had footprints, and we had um, audio of them, and we had, even though some blurry pictures, we had blurry pictures. I think science would stop and go, well, wait a minute, maybe this thing is still real, maybe this thing is still up there, but I, out there. But I think the fact of this thing's on two legs, it's humanoid. Um, I think there's an arrogance a lot of times with science or even a lot of people out there who don't get out in the woods and they think there's no way this thing could exist. There's no way this is real. Mm. And it is frustrating. I understand completely. I mean, I think anyone who's had an encounter and comes out and talks about it, Frank, I think goes through that. I went through it. I mean, I was drugged through the mud. I was called every name in the book um, by people I've never, <laughs> never even met. Um, and But I think everyone kind of goes through that. And I think it's getting more and more acceptable than it was back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, I think in the last probably 10 years, um, people are starting to go, well, wait a minute, maybe there's something out there. And that's one of the reasons why I created the show is to give people an opportunity to talk about what they experienced. You know, if people think Frank's crazy, okay, well, what about the other, you know, thousands of witnesses I've had? Thousands, on yeah. Are they all nuts? You know, is everyone here, you know, it's sure funny how Frank says different things through his encounter. And it's the same thing a guy saying in Washington State. It's the same thing a guy saying in Pennsylvania. It's the same thing a guy saying, you know, guy or gal is saying in California. I just had Jamie on the show, um, you know, the guest prior, and he was talking about the Ohio Howl, hearing the Ohio Howl. Um, and that's just a vocalization. Let's not even talk about you know, uh, people seeing it. Let's just focus on this voc vocalization that was captured in Ohio. Now you might think, well, that's crazy. I don't know what that is. What if I could have another vocalization from Texas that you could listen to that's very similar to what you just heard? Now, what is this down in Texas? Now, how about if I play one from Pennsylvania? Um, mm -hmm. And I think most of the people in the Bigfoot yeah, world... The yeah, they sound the same. And most people in the Bigfoot world would listen to that and go, oh, that's the Ohio howl. Well, no, this is from Pennsylvania. <laughs> you know, so I mean, uh, th there's yeah. it's almost laughable at this point that uh, the general public and science doesn't take this seriously because there's so much more evidence out there than I, you know, besides a dead body, I don't know what else we can do. You know, what else can we now, do? You know, I just kind of highlighted my experiences. I haven't told you all of them. Of course, it would take a long time to tell you everything. But um, as a kid, used to hear whistles coming from the woods and we got to where we wouldn't mimic those whistles and we'd sit there two or three hours because we didn't have a tv to either listen to the radio or go to bed so we used to sit on the front porch after dark we sat there and whistle at these things and uh you'd hear one over to the left and then 30 minutes later there would be another one start up over to the right and you just call them in and, and sit there and, and have a whistling contest with them. Um, many times I've done that. I mean, that was that was our pastime. But yeah, I mean, it, I can mimic their whistles down almost to the tee. Um, it's, it's crazy to say that you've done that. Of course, we don't, I can't prove what I was whistling to or, or, or what was whistling back. But Something was there whistling, I know that. Now, my last encounter was in 1988. As, as far as close encounter, I had moved around. I mean, over the years, you know, I'd moved to different spots and uh, on several pieces of property. And uh, I got tired of, I had moved to Nashville and uh, found, you know, that's where all the good work was at. So I lived in Nashville for a long time. And then I moved back up there to East Tennessee in 88. My girlfriend was living with me at the time. We had a young baby. And I had a six-year-old son from a previous marriage. We had moved out in the country up there. Because I'm more comfortable in the country than I am in the city. I know what's out there, but I'm still more comfortable. 
I like the woods. I mean, I, I, I feel at home there. We moved out as a house. We had rented the house at this time out on the uh, Finger Ridge outside of this town I'm talking about. Now, it was on the opposite side of this town where these counters happened when I was small to where this one happened in 88. Um, at probably 30 miles distance. Anyway, she we lived there for a couple of months. It was in the middle of February. All the leaves off trees. We had these two little dogs, weighed about 15, 20 pounds, two little brown dogs, and a good-natured dog. We had a uh, back deck. We had kind of like a four-foot run all the way around the house that connected the deck to the doors. We didn't have a door back there at the deck. And uh, one out about 9.30. Uh, actually, I were to start ahead of this. Three days prior to this, something killed one of my little dogs. <laughs> so I went out. And they hadn't made it home by about 10 o'clock, I guess, 11 o'clock. So I went out, took the shotgun out. I was calling for him. They didn't answer. So I went back in the house. I probably stayed out there about 15 minutes calling for him. Off that finger ridge was just big hollow valley, a gorge, you know, spooky. It was spooky down in there, I'm telling you, it was. Anyway, uh, about 10 minutes after going back to the house, heard something at the front door, opened the front door, and there laid one of my dogs. And uh, the son to the mother that was still missing. And uh, somebody, I mean, it looked like somebody took a razor blade and sliced this dog up. He's still alive, but... I mean, he made it back to that front door, and he made sure he banged on it <laughs> because that's the only way we knew he was out there. I didn't give up for the night. I had to go to work next day. So anyway, we brought him in and uh, gave him a bath, washed the blood and stuff off of him, and I sewed up, stitched him up the best I could. I went out the next morning, early the next morning, found the other dog down in that gorge, and... Uh, she was dead, and like I say, she only weighed about 15 pounds, 18, something like that. She's small, less than a foot high. The only marks I found on that dog was two puncture wounds in her stomach, about three inches apart, and about as big as a pencil, each, each puncture wound, and that's the only marks that was on that dog. The other one had been cut up pretty bad. I mean, it... it if you took a razor blade and sliced him, that's what it looked like. About three days later, or three nights later, my girlfriend at about 9.30 took the garbage out, and uh, she had to walk, go out the door and walk down that little four-foot rail to the back of the deck. And off of the back of the deck, I had a, a thing where I, a couple of garbage cans sat on it. she come running back in the house, scared to death. She said, get your gun. There's something out there. I said, what is it? You know, jumps up. What is it? She said, that thing is about 10 foot tall, and it is ugly. Because we only had a porch light, and, and it, it was about 10 foot away from her. And the deck was about four foot high, and she was looking at eye to eye. And um, so I grabbed my gun and went out there. And, of course, I didn't see nothing, but I could hear it. It had then dropped down in that gorge where the, there was no light. Um, it's probably about 60 foot away from me at this time. And you could hear the footsteps crunch, crunch, every footstep. Now, the gun I grabbed was a 44 Magnum rifle in Marlin. I always kept it loaded because I lived in the woods. I know what was in the woods. I hollered at, at it. I mean, it was right straight down in front of me. It didn't stop. It just kept its pace crunch, crunch. So I hollered louder and screamed at it. Nothing. It did not stop. It didn't change its pace. didn't take off running. So I fired that 44 Magnum off up into the air. Well, it stopped. And it stopped for about 10 seconds. And then it proceeded its pace. Crunch, crunch. It didn't take off running. So I stood out there and now 
it was a little bit of light. I mean, not a lot, but you couldn't see down in that gorge from from the trees, and it's just dark down in there. It was in the gorge, and I was up on top of the finger ridge, and I just kind of followed the pace around and uh, let it get in front of me. And I just eased back on the top of that finger ridge and was listening to it. Now, on both sides was uh, a gorge, and they come around and met into one. And at the bottom was about a 15, 12 or 15 foot drop, you know, where the water had washed it out. And, and it was a good 12 or 15 foot high. I heard it jump off of that and continue its pace. It did not break stride. It jumped. I heard it hit. And I listened to it go all the way down that gorge, crunching in leaves and twigs. Next day, I went to Wally World and bought me one of the strongest spotlights I could find. The day after that, I went and bought me a 30 6 automatic. That's the last incident I ever had with one of them. Do you think that it killed your, your dogs? Do you think the creature killed your dogs? I, 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 I don't you? know what killed those dogs, but I mean, the teeth marks or the fang marks, the puncture wounds, there were two... Three inches, I measured them. I measured those puncher wounds. They were three inches apart, and they were big as a a pencil. Now, there was no blood come out of it. She never had a spot of blood on her. Strange. Oh, I mean, she was frozen stiff because it got down pretty cold that night. But, uh, yeah, the other dog never would even go to the back of the house. He stayed in the front of the house. Never did he go back, back to the back. Now, of an evening, I, I had to work during the day, of course. And of an evening, sometimes I'd get home and just about the dusky dark, um, if I went around the corner of the house, I could smell this rank, dead smell. And it's not every time I'd smell it, probably once or twice a week, I'd smell that. And I thought, there's something dead here. <laughs> and, um, and then it dawned on me, you know, those things. Sasquatch stink. I've had a lot of people tell me Sasquatch stink. Now, this is long before the Internet. Of course, I, I have found out so much more since I've got YouTube and, and found your podcast and all these others. But I think you do a better job than half of them out there or 90% of them out there. Um, I appreciate that, man. It just, um, of course, most of that stuff you see on TV, that wave them off for fools that they are. Few of them are, are intelligent, but, but most of them are just fools. You won't find Sasquatch. Don't go out there with the army and, and, you know, go out there by yourself, you or your buddy, and he'll find you. Guarantee it. Yeah, no, I agree with you. One one thing I wanted to ask you about the, the puncture holes, um, were they in the neck of the dog? Where where was the puncture holes located? They they were in her belly, side of her belly. Hmm to where it looked like something just rest down and, and, and took a bite out of her. Yeah. Um, she didn't have no slobber on her, um, no blood on her. All, all it was, it was up two holes. You know, it's such a strange killing there, especially with the, um, there being no blood. It makes you wonder if, if these things got a hold of it and why they would kill your dogs. You know, a lot of times dogs will run. Usually it's the big dogs that get it, not the littler dogs. You know what I mean? I had heard those dogs uh, when I had got home. It was it was uh, uh, right at dark when I got home that night. That night. Uh, I had heard those dogs uh, barking down there. I didn't think nothing about the all time barking, and uh, but they were really raising pain. And then when they didn't get, come home, I went to look for them, and because uh, it was my son's dogs, and uh, we were kind of attached to them. They were family members. And, uh, but, uh, sure enough, I mean, she had no blood on her, not one bit. It's definitely odd. It's very strange, very odd. Um, then I know you have so much more that you can share with the audience. I'll definitely have to have you back, Frank. Um, I really enjoyed talking with you. I enjoyed hearing your encounters and, and hearing your take on it. I, I'm with, you know, it's hard to say what these things are. Uh, you do, you run the, you definitely get a, 
uh, a broad spectrum of behaviors with them. Uh, you know, like them collecting the firewood, you know, even though you guys didn't see it. I mean, what else is going to bring a, a big pile of firewood to your house? And then you get this other. That big, had to be. That had to be one of them. Yeah, I, I would agree with I you. Mean, this is, I would agree with you. On this that. was a big pile of wood. Yeah, and well, uh, I mean, who's going to collect wood and come bring it up to your guys' house, especially being out in the middle of nowhere? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, who's going to do that? That's very odd. Not a person, I mean, would would do that. But you, then you get the behaviors of them, you know, following you through the woods, uh, or your dogs being killed, or you know, sometimes you get very aggressive behavior from these things. And I've I've now. I don't mean to interrupt you. No, go ahead. As far as ag- aggressive, um, thinking and looking back on the night it followed me out of the woods, that thing was never, never aggressive towards me. It never growled. I never heard no growl. I never heard no whoop, no holler, no, no, no whistle, no nothing, no breathing. All I heard was those heavy footsteps. But as far as being... Of course, the aggressive part was in my head and in my stomach. <laughs> I wanted to empty my insides out. I was scared to death, so um, I believe it. I had, I didn't have, you know, I didn't know the thing's intentions. Yeah. Um, and that's the worst, isn't it, though, Frank? Is, isn't that the worst? You know, I'm a big scary guy, but to admit fear um, and, and and being afraid for your life. Is a tough th- a tough thing to do, especially for guys like us. You know, it's that's not an easy thing to do to go. Hey, I was scared. I was legitimately terrified in that moment. Um, and you could be well, right; it was pushing you out, but uh, right. it's still terrifying. I, I have I have been shot at over the years. I mean, I I had a bullet hit two foot away from me on, on a brick wall. Um, jealous boyfriend, but um, I've been stabbed and I've been cut. And now I, I had no way to defend myself. Neither time, I I wasn't nowhere near as scared as I was that night. And I don't ever want that again. Like I say, it makes me. I think you sit around and think about it. And it makes me so mad. I just want to take my gun up and kill it. Yeah. But in the same breath, I want to leave them be. They have a right to live. I understand. But I do agree with you. You're going to have to bring a body in and shove it down everybody's throat. Yeah. There's no question about that. Well, thank you for agreeing with me, because not too many people do. <laughs> I've been called every name in the book, but it's just reality. Yeah, well, it's not, uh, it's nothing personal. That's against... the assholes are sitting there recliners and saying, leave my alone. You yeah, know, yeah, that's true. They don't have any experience whatsoever. Yeah. Well, I thank you so much for taking the time to come on, Frank, and and taking the time out of your evening to do this and and share uh, your encounters. Because, you know, the more that people share, the more uh, I think it changes people's minds when you hear encounter after encounter after encounter, you know, and then you hear. I'll tell you what, your, your, your show, your podcast is one of the biggest release to my well-being, my psychic. I sit there and I listen to other people's experiences and and I know that I'm not the only crazy person on the face of this earth. That happened to me. Yeah. That was real. There's no question about it. Yeah. And I can't, uh, I can't thank you enough for what you do. I mean, I can't. No thanks needed. The the thing the we, things goes to you, people like you, Frank, that are willing to come on. We not, we not need me. you bad. I mean, so there's some people leaving the air. I've noticed, and you know they don't know what they're doing, but um, that's why they're leaving the air. But, uh, yeah, whatever we need to do to keep you on here, people need a release. It helps to talk about it to someone that understands has been there really i've listened to your encounter and i'm surprised you didn't have a heart attack that night i wish i could see one as clear as you did that's what i'm wanting i'd love to i'd love to see one up close and personal but that's half of it the other half's chicken i don't nothing to do with them yeah um 
you know, it, it's it's that, you know, you're 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 pulled both ways. Yeah, no, I get it. Well, I appreciate the the kind words and uh, thank you again for coming on. All right, I appreciate you having me on, and uh, it's nice talking to you. And like I say, that's, I'll give you the highlights. There's a bunch of stuff happened over the years that uh, nothing is exciting as this, but a lot of little stuff that I did not share. My mom and dad both, uh, um, they would, after we got up to a certain age, they'd start telling their stories that happened to them when they were young. And this dates back into 20s and 30s. And they grew up in the same area as I was in here with these things. Well, I'll definitely have to have you back. All right, Wes, I appreciate you calling. I won't take up any more of your time. No, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Have a good day. You too. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. Check out sasquatchchronicles.com. If you get a chance, you can become a member, help support the show. Until next time, everyone, 